reading the script your infinite eye wrote for you. Remember the Truman Show? Everyone Truman met every day was an actor, without exception. No one could say or do anything in Truman's life that was not scripted by Ed Harris, of course. Now, when an actor is finished reading his script in Truman's life, that actor may leave the movie set and have a life of its own to go to. But as long as he is in the Truman Show, he is an actor, not a player. According to the human game model, this is true in your holographic 3D total immersion movie as well. The same thing applies to the movie The Game. Everyone was an actor playing a role, reading a script in Michael Douglas's game, even his brother. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. Thank you, William Shakespeare. All right, it's time to look more closely at how this human game works. And once again, I want to acknowledge Robert Scheinfeld for introducing me to his version of this model. Let's start with a very short description. The human game is a series of outer experiences in the holographic universe that the player reacts and responds to in order to produce inner experiences in order to share those feelings with its infinite eye through the connection between the two. As players, we do this all the time. We go to a movie, we play a sport, we watch a sunset, or go to a music concert, in order to have an inner experience from the outer experience, in order to have the feelings associated with that experience. But we don't always choose experiences that are nice and blissful. Apparently, we have no problem voluntarily going to a horror movie or through a haunted house on Halloween or participating in extreme sports. Crazy, scary, even dangerous stuff just to have the inner feelings. So we should also have no problem understanding that our infinite eye would create a game like this for us to play as well. And like most games, the human game is divided into two parts. The first part of the human game is designed for the player to experience as much limitation as possible, like going into a cave to the deepest, darkest place on a treasure hunt. Once the player has discovered the treasure, it has to find its way out of the cave again and bring the treasure home. That's the second part of the human game. What's the treasure in this case? Well, instead of gold or jewels, there's a little note inside the treasure chest that says, It isn't real. It's all a game. That's the treasure that can radically change your life much more so than gold or jewels. But just like in any treasure hunt, there are rules to the human game. According to this model, these are the rules for the first part of the human game. See if any of these rules are true in your own life. Rule number one. The players must forget who they really are, a player, and believe they are something else instead. At the extremes, for example, that they are their body or that they are their infinite eye. Rule number two the players must believe their holographic experiences are real and what they perceive with their senses is actually happening out there in some objective and independent reality. Rule number three. The players must believe what they encounter out there has power over them and the power to affect their lives. Rule number four. The players must believe in the judgments of good and bad, right and wrong, better and worse, good and evil. Rule number five. 
The players must believe there is something wrong with the reality they see out there that needs to be changed or fixed or improved. Rule number six. The players must believe they have the power to create a different reality than what they are experiencing and therefore feel defective and deficient, more limited, when they fail. Rule number seven. The players must believe they can think their way out of the first part of the human game by using their mind or love their way out of it by using their heart. Rule number eight. The players must believe they can make something happen and when they fail, blame themselves for not being smarter or better or working harder. Rule number nine. The players must believe there are goals to be reached, or agendas to be satisfied, or lessons to be learned. Rule number 10. The players must believe they, and they alone, are responsible for meeting their own needs and wants, which they have to fight for. Rule number 11. Fear and resistance are the foundations of the first part of the human game, and judgments and their resulting beliefs are the glue that keeps the illusions together. And rule number 12, these illusions must never break down or the players would see through the game and it would be over. To put it briefly, the first part of the human game was designed to experience limitation and restriction in all shapes and sizes, and all these rules lead to that. So if you have been following the rules, and you literally could not do anything else, you have most likely experienced a great deal of limitation in your life. You just didn't know why until now. I understand that you probably didn't like the limitation of the first part of the human game, that it didn't feel good, that it didn't feel right, and that you think you have been doing something wrong. But you haven't, and neither have I. We've been playing the human game exactly as we should, exactly as our infinite eyes created us and wanted us to. Even the judgment and resistance haven't been wrong, since they led to more limitation. In other words, we've been doing a fantastic job as the players we were created to be. But since the first part of the human game is intentionally the opposite of the natural state of an infinite eye, it takes an enormous amount of power to create it and keep it going. I really like the analogy of a roller coaster in an amusement park. It takes an enormous amount of power to defy gravity and pull those heavy cars filled with people up the first hill. It's unnatural. It's uncomfortable. It's work. I don't know what goes on in your mind, but I often hear myself saying, Why the hell did I agree to do this? Am I crazy? Let me off of this thing. I'm going to die today. This is nuts. I'm getting sick. Who designed this crazy ride? I'm going to kill them when I get off, if I survive. Yes, I would resist that first hill with everything I had. I didn't like it, it didn't feel good, and I questioned my sanity for getting on the ride in the first place. Likewise, going as much as possible into human limitation produces the same reactions. It's supposed to. That's the game. But another reason I like the roller coaster analogy is that we can never experience or appreciate the ride to come if we don't go up that first big hill. Like the human game, a roller coaster has two parts. You go up the hill in the first part and down the hill in the second part. If looked at objectively, the first part of a roller coaster is no better or worse than the second part, even if it might feel that way to the people on it. In fact, 
the second part of the roller coaster could not exist without the first part. So there can be no judgment that one part is better than the other. That's also true for the human game. Someone riding on the second part of the roller coaster is no more enlightened or better or more advanced or ascended than someone going up the first hill. They're just at a different point on the ride. That's all. The last reason I like this analogy is that it reverses how we normally think about limitation. Rather than going down into limitation or down into the depths, the first part of the roller coaster is up. So instead of saying that we reach the bottom in our lives, it's better in my mind to say that we reach the pinnacle or the peak or the apex of limitation when it's then time to start playing the second part of the human game. For me, this also helps take away the judgment. So let me use me as an example to make this more real. I was about to turn 62 years old, January of 2008, sitting in my apartment in Greenville, South Carolina. And I realized I had no job, and no one wanted to hire me. I had no car. I had no money. I had no relationship, no one to love. I had two marriages, each of which failed after about 15 years because of my own issues. Although I had a few close friends, none of them lived within a thousand miles of me. I had a wonderful family, including three fantastic grandchildren, but other than my daughter and her husband, I hardly got to see them. I had written two books that no one was buying and apparently no one wanted to read. I had no future plans, no idea how anything would change. In other words, I didn't think I could ever become any more limited in my life. But the interesting thing was that I was not upset about any of it. No fear, no regret, no judgment, no panic, no feeling sorry for myself. I was completely neutral about it all, not resisting any of it, simply saying, oh, so that's how it is, and embracing my situation without needing it to change. Two days later, I went over the top of the first hill of the roller coaster and moved into the second part of the human game thanks to watching a DVD series from Robert Scheinfeld, who gave me the missing piece of the puzzle I had been working on for 40 years. Looking back later, I had the thought that since I was no longer judging or resisting my experiences, and therefore no longer had any reaction or response in the face of limitations and restrictions, I had become virtually useless to my infinite eye as a player in the first part of the human game. So for me, the first part was over. I had found the treasure at the bottom of the deep, dark cave, and now it was time to bring it back home. And so I started playing the second part of the human game. The second part of the human game is the opposite of the first part. Rule number one. The player knows what it has been calling reality is not real at all, but a hologram created by its infinite eye to play the human game. This game is being played by consciousness, in consciousness, and for consciousness. In fact, there is no out there, out there, no independent objective reality. Rule number two. The player knows, once it has moved into the second part, all holograms experienced by the player will be totally in support of coming out of the cave rather than toward more limitation and restriction. Rule number three. The player knows it can never and will never experience anything in any hologram its infinite eye has not created and wanted to experience 
and that its infinite eye has written and approved the script being used by anyone else appearing in the player's hologram. No one else in the player's hologram can ever do or say anything its own infinite eye has not requested.